Okay, welcome everyone to the third of our conversations about <laughs> even compare ours. This one is titled The Causes of Poverty, the Economic Crisis and Beyond. We're that you could join us and we're excited to have another opportunity to listen to and learn from Dr. Stephen Compare. So he's joining us as in the previous two webinars from New York and we're hosting the webinar here from Portland. Let me just introduce a couple of other folks are uh, were involved in the preparation of this webinar. One is my colleague here in Portland, Nikki Martin. You'll probably hear her voice a little bit later as, as we take some of your questions and comments. And I also want to recognize uh, Kate Baldus, our colleague at the Bank Street College of Education in New York, who was instrumental in preparing this webinar as well. Just a housekeeping items, and then I'll turn the presentation over to Stephen. Um, you probably noticed we have the phone lines muted to reduce background noise. We have 127 folks signed up to participate in this webinar, so with that large of a group, uh, the potential for background noise is very high. So to uh, make some more enjoyable presentation, we're going to keep the phone lines muted and take questions and comments via the chat. Uh, those of you who just participated in the poll, the chat panel may have collapsed on you, so you'll need to expand that, but uh, I'll just show you here on the slide. This is what the channel should look like, and then it should be over here on the right-hand side of your screen. So we will have, uh, particularly at the end, an opportunity for a formal question and answer session, but if during the presentation you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, please do so through the chat panel. Um, we will be using some of our annotation tools, I'll point to them on the slide right now so you can see what they like. They appear somewhere up here on the top left corner of your screen. We will use some of that a little bit later in the presentation. We end with our official presentation by noon or 3 o'clock, um, but planning to stick around after that if you can to continue the conversation and, and any additional questions folks have. Uh, we also want to acknowledge that some of you, when you registered, submitted some questions ahead of time. Thank you very much for doing that. We have those with us, and we'll see if we can find opportunities to weave those questions into the session. So I think with that, we're ready to go, and I will turn the presentation over to Stephen. Thank you, Eric. Oh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Glad to have all of you here with us today. Um, I see that many of you have attended uh, the previous webinar on poverty data, um, and I'm hoping that if you didn't, you've had a chance to watch it on the Vista campus, or that um, you'll take an opportunity somewhere down the road to go ahead and do that. So I'm not going to bother to introduce myself again, which I did on that webinar. Um, I do want to say a little bit about, about this to start, about my own perspective on the questions we've got at hand today. Now, some of you will remember from webinar one that we discussed so-called flawed character explanations for poverty, the ways in which bad behavior or poor choices might explain why it is that people are poor. Now, my own experience of poor and low-income people throughout New York City here, and my research on poverty and inequality and welfare policies suggests that there's not good evidence to support those kinds of claims. As look here at what our goals are for the course of today, I'll say that through the lens of the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009, I will focus our attention today on the particular ways in which changes in the economy and in labor markets, large and small, affect people's ability to provide for themselves and their families. Now, this is what Bradley Schiller, some of you will remember from that first webinar, would call a restriction opportunities kind of explanation. The point is to help you all think about the deep-seated structural sources of the poverty that you're likely seeing in your own agencies and in your own communities, and to better understand the challenges that many Americans are facing now, and by extension, to understand a bit about the challenges they face in so-called normal times, too. Now, before we begin to examine some of the data that will help us make sense of what's happening in the United States today, remember that the charts and graphs and the large economic patterns we're going to be looking at represent the lives of real people. 
met many millions of real people. And I've emphasized that. Here's one illustration of some of the factors we'll be talking about today. Now, this, some of you may recognize, comes from the Tumblr collection of what are now well over 200 pages of images that Americans have posted tell their own stories about their own struggles. I'll read what this one, that's in case you can't see the type. But as I read, go ahead and use the chat that Eric was pointing at a bit earlier um, and see if you can identify the factors that are identified here that contribute to poverty. You should also feel free to weigh in with any other factors that you think are important in understanding the poverty that you are seeing. So this is follows. Three days old. I've only incurred thousands in medical debt, even though I have good insurance. My dad laid off when construction all but stopped in 2008. He hasn't been able to find anything more than temp work that paid more than a third of what he was making. He went back to school after more than 10 years. When he graduates, he will be over $100,000 in debt. My mom will still be paying on her student loans when I'm in college. Well, she was able to find a stable union job with the county and has been able to pay the bills. Well, most of them. We bought a small 20-year-old two-bedroom house in 2006, only to watch its value drop from $250,000 to $65,000. Hundreds of calls, emails, and faxes to the bank in an attempt to modify the loan, we received a notice of trustee sale. Our only option is to move in with my grandparents. This is the American dream. It'll be this hard. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask um, Nikki. I'm looking over at the chat. I don't see anything. Am I missing something, Nikki, or, or are folks being being quiet and reticent today? I could taking a little bit of think time, but things are okay. That's in. good. The, the common generational poverty. Um, versus one-time incidents resulting in poverty. Mm -hmm. and this, is, this is Eric. Let me just jump in for a second. I think we had um, uh, obviously direction. Um, just so folks are doing this already, but if you could send a chat to all participants, I think the keeping slide said to send it to the host. But if you could please instead send it to all participants, all of us will then be able to see it. There we go. So I see how April's talking about the high cost of health care, right, as we'll talk about it a little bit, this becomes hugely important, particularly for un unemployed people who lose their insurance. Um, you know, Alex here is pointing out sort of government support. We'll also talk a little bit about this down the road, about the ways in which historically and in the current period, government does and does not step in in particular kinds of ways to, to help in these kinds of urgent situations. High unemployment rates, yeah, the problem that even even folks with the, the access to jobs sometimes are in low-paying jobs. Um, high cost of education, which again we'll talk about in a little bit, creates its own sets of problems, both in terms of coming up with the money to pay for while you're trying to retrain, maybe to get back into the job market, and depending on the kinds of loans you've taken and how much they are, the, the, the real burden that that can impose upon lots and lots of people for many, many, many years. Um, underemployment, Alyssa Wang, and I think that's important as well. It's not just difficulty in finding jobs. It's not sometimes that, that those jobs are low wage. But sometimes, you know, you can find a decent job, but it only is 20 hours a week as opposed to 40. And often if it's 20 hours a week, it doesn't have benefits, which presents its own kind of problem. Eight points to the housing bubble. Yeah, we'll talk about that. But that's hugely important, both in affecting household wealth and, and having other kinds of cascade effects on other kinds of factors. Um, folks, just another moment or so, especially if they wound up um, using that default message and sending it to someplace else other than all participants if they want to weigh in. As we move on also, you should feel free to use that chat if you want to weigh in and make observations about what's going on there. I'm probably not going to pay really close attention to the chat um, because I'm going to be focusing on getting through the material we're going to focus on, but I know that Nikki is going to be looking at the chat. Um, so you should know that, that she'll be looking in there, and as we get to, to moments where we pause for Q&A, um, she'll be sort of scouring through that to see if anything that's useful to sort of bring to all of our collective attention that we can talk about. All right, so why don't we go ahead and move on from there. I want to step back just a bit with this story and stories like it in mind and look at some of the larger causes of the recent economic crisis, which many are now calling the Great Recession. 
No, it's the worst economic crisis since the depression of the 1930s. And listed officially from December of 2007 through till June of 2009. It's the longest and the deepest economic downturn since World War II. The effects of that linger today, as, as we're going to see. So we examine the facts of that crisis. As I said, I want to spend just a bit of time talking about the causes. And there are a few pieces to that puzzle, and here it's represented by three images. We've got crash of the housing market, rising yeah. unemployment, collapse of the finance banking sector, and sharp declines in the stock market. So the piece of that puzzle is the real estate bubble. A large and rapid rise in home values from about the late 1990s to the mid-2000s. The magazine called it the biggest bubble in history. American prices went up somewhere in the neighborhood of 75% just from 1997 to 2005. Now, one of the causes of that was a change in how mortgages were issued. Now, it used to be that banks were an incentive to be very very cautious about loans that they gave out people for houses since if the homeowner defaulted, that bank was going to be stuck with house. But with the question of things called mortgage-backed securities and other clear financial devices, mortgages were no longer held by the bank that wrote the loan, but they were sold off to investment banks who then bundled them all together and sold them off as particular kinds of investments. Now, suddenly, the incentives to write mortgages for people who couldn't afford them, and times would never have gotten the loan. And the more tricks were devised, including adjustable rate mortgages and interest-only loans for very large amounts. And what happened was that those loans would start out affordable, but the rates adjusted, and high balloon payments that some came do. But in much of this period, housing values kept rising, and financial institutions wanted more and more loans to write. They just refinanced their mortgages when the rates adjusted. And all that rising equity, right, the value that they had in their homes, encouraged other people to use their homes a bit like automatic teller machines, right, refinancing them and taking out the cash. Some things were frivolous things to be sure, but very often simply to pay household bills in one way make up for what we now know are decades worth of stagnant wages and a declining middle class. Now, that really precarious set of strategies worked more or less as long as home prices kept on rising. But going to the most famous early bubble, the, the tulip mania of 1637, and at its peak at the tulip mania, a single tulip bulb sold for more than a year's wages for the average worker. Right. Just like then, all bubbles burst. And so this one. So when the bubble burst, home prices start falling and falling fast. Now, there are two effects. One was on individual households. The other was on those financial institutions that had bundled those mortgages together and resold them as supposedly low-risk investments. See here some of the effects on households. A decline in net worth, particularly among people of color. Let me see if I can get this to function. Right. So that decline in net work we're looking just from 2005 to 2009. Hispanics, African Americans, and white households. So declines in household worth across the board, but much steeper declines among people of color. Now, part of what was going on here is that for a lot of Hispanics and African Americans, the equity in home in their homes was often the only wealth they had. So when they lost that value, lost the, the majority of their wealth. Part of what was also going on is a lot of those lenders paid on low-income communities of color in order to, in, in what we now know were often deceptive practices, to sell those adjustable rate mortgages. Now, that is 
this is, it wasn't after 2009. In 10, homes lost $1.1 trillion in value. And here in 2011, another $700 billion in value. We're now at the point where home prices today have fallen back to where they were back in 2003. Remember, there were two effects, right? The individual household effect and then the effect on all of those institutions. Here is one way to see the effect of that collapsing housing bubble on institutions. There's so many financial assets for invest houses tied up in those mortgage backed securities I mentioned, which, by the way, assumed that housing prices would always rise. When real estate started to decline, some securities firms went bankrupt. Or they off at bargain rates to more stable firms, and often this was made possible with government loan guarantees. Now, because they couldn't cover the losses they made on their housing bets, and among other things, caused the stock market to tumble and to tumble pretty dramatically. And that's what this slide here shows. But but it's even worse than this because. The other thing that happened was that, that credit dried up for all sorts of businesses. Like nobody wanted to loan money to anybody else because you didn't know if they had all of these investments that are suddenly worthless, right, because of the way these mortgages were bundled up and sold off to other banks. Nobody quite knew who owned the mortgages that were still worth something and who owned the ones who, who were, were a net loss, right? So as all this was going on, one of the things that happened was that banks started Started hoarding cash, right, for fear that if they lent it, lent it out, they'd never get it back again. And they were hoarding cash because they were worried about covering their own over leveraged bets. What happens when, when you go to the bank and nobody's willing to make you a loan? Businesses held back expansion, they held production, held back hiring, A, because they couldn't get loans to expand their business, and B, because they were afraid they wouldn't have any customers. That, in turn, led among consumers, too. As if Americans no longer had ready access to the cash in their homes, and on top of that, they're worried about whether, if they were already employed, they have any future income in a bad economy, whether they would lose their job somewhere down the road, too, if they hadn't already. So one of the things that happened was that people start hanging on to their money. People who had money were hanging on to it. They were hoarding it a bit for fear of that uncertain future. This is a lot of sense for those individuals and families in turbulent times. Right? You know, what the future is going to hold, you hold on to your money, you keep it safe in a bank account. That makes sense at the individual level and at the family level. But terrible for the economy overall. Economists even have it for it. They call it the paradox of thrift. Right? People are saving money instead of spending it after all. All those companies who sell things don't have any left anymore. People are holding their money. They're not going out and buying things. They're not getting a new refrigerator. They're not buying a new car. They're wearing the washer and dryer in hopes that they can get another year out of it instead of buying a new one. So all of those companies that manufacture things and sell things, they see declining sales, which means that they slow down production, which means that they lay off workers, setting further in motion this terrible cycle of decline. And that's just what happened. Having thought through all of that, right? So I'll pause here a little bit so everybody sort of catch their breath and try to sort of uh, uh, get this into their heads and make sense. And we just want to sort of get a sense of the room here um, to see sort of how tuned in you all are to the ongoing unemployment news and also to get a sense of what your own experiences have been, right? So we've got an anonymous poll here with two questions, as you can see. Um, Eric, do we just remind folks what it is that they need to do here in case it's not self evident? Sure. On your, the right hand side of your screen, you should have seen a poll appear. Please take a couple of minutes to answer the two questions and then click submit after you've provided your responses. We'll give us a 
about a minute or so to contemplate the questions and submit responses, and then we'll close the poll and publish the results. Okay, well, 20 more seconds. Okay, we'll go ahead and close the poll. Looks like uh, just about 90% of the folks submitted responses. So that okay. should be fairly representative. So we'll close the poll. Doing a little number crunching in the background here. <laughs> Look, it wouldn't take that long. What do they got, monkeys with abacuses? Yeah. Okay. There we go. So let me publish the results. Screen, you should see the results. Uh, so, there you go, right? So we're looking at, at very nearly two thirds of, of the folks participating with us today have ever had an individual experience with unemployment or uh, experience in their families with unemployment, which didn't surprise me in the least, truth told, because we're living in a moment when, when unemployment is, is at record levels again since the Great Depression um, and is enormously widespread. Um, as a consequence, it also looks like folks have a pretty good sense as to what those those national numbers look like. Um, so why don't we move on to the next slide? And in fact, we see here um, in visual form what's happened to that official unemployment rate. Right, it's not written in here all the way to the right, but the most recent number is 8.3 percent, as about half of you um, got um, January 2. 2012, right? That 8.3 percent, just so we sort of like the actual humans affected here in mind, is about 12.8 million people. Right? Also, think about for each unemployed person in the household, how many other people are affected, right? So it's even if it's 12.8 million unemployed people, it's going to be significantly more people affected by that. Now, uh, as I emphasized a lot in the last webinar and even in the first one, it's important to remember the averages can obscure all kinds of important variation. So as best things are here, they're reverse for African Americans. There's a shoal unemployment rate January was not 8.3% but 13.6%. And for Hispanics, 10.5% rather than 8.3%. And it's been even worse for young veterans whose rate is right now hovering around 30%. If we look at the slide, what we're looking at here is the Labor Department's broadest measure of unemployment, which, unlike the slide that we just saw, the, the, what the Labor Department calls its U3 measure, this measure, the U6 measure, includes people who are missing from that full number, like people who have been unemployed for so long that they've been looking for work anymore, and people who need full-time jobs in order to meet their bills and support families, but only have part-time ones, right? So this, this includes both the underemployed and the long-term unemployed who have given up looking. Notice, um, and that number is 15.1% is for January, rather than that 8.3%, right? Almost twice the official unemployment number is this broader measure that I would argue gives us a better sense as to how many people are being affected by unemployment. Right? It's projected to still be over 15% by 2015 by a lot of folks. Right? And remember, so right, just as official poverty numbers obscure a lot, so do the official statistics. Right? And that U3, that lower number, is the number that as a rule you're going to see reported in the newspapers and on television. Um, talking about monthly unemployment data coming out. Um, keep this in mind, right? Very often that broader measure comes close to being twice as high. 
And now in this context, we think back again, right? Remember what happened to the housing market that, that people sell their homes because they more on them than they're actually worth. To make worse, people are trapped geographically, right? They can't just move to find a job or to go to a deeper area or to move in with family and let's just walk away from their homes and let their banks the best take them, which in fact increasing numbers of people are doing. And through another kind of vicious cycle gets set in motion, right? Loss can lead to fault, which can lead to foreclosure, which can lead to abandoned houses, which can affect the value of all the rest of the homes in that neighborhood, which can then in turn lead to declining values in those homes and lead to reduced household with among those other people who maybe are 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 or were a little bit more financially secure. Okay. So let's go on. And other aspect of the problem. And what's what's in place worse here is that the recovery from this recession has been unbelievably slow and finding a job often very difficult has been especially hard of late. Right? So these lines here so far, excuse me, how far employment dropped once the recession began and how long it took back to get how long it took to get back to normal. This red line here, that's the current recession. Unfortunately. I see, right, the job loss was much worse than the selection of other recessions in the last forty years or so. And not only was the decline sharper, look how much more slowly. I mean, if we if we were to right, carry this line back over, look, we'd have to go well off the screen in order to get back up to where we began in 2007 at the beginning of the Russian, right? This is part of why there are lots of economists who predict, and not properly so, we won't be back to full employment levels until 2019, they say. And it's likely decades before housing returns to its recent, top, its recent highs, right? So remember this, right? The session may have officially ended in 2009, but effects linger and are likely to linger for many years to come. Now that slow recovery we saw in that red line shows up again here in long-term unemployment rates, right? So part of what we see going on here, it's not just that we have more unemployed people, but that they're being, that they're being unemployed for a longer period of time, and yet another vicious cycle gets set in motion because in some ways the longer you're unemployed, of course, the more desperate you are for work because the more fragile your family life becomes, but the longer you're out of work, often the harder it becomes to find work. Right? Some employers will only hire people who already have a job for fear that if you've been unemployed too long, well, your, your skills are going to get rusty or your contracts have dried up or, or your knowledge has become outdated and so on. If there's a consequence of this, there are analysts who have worried about whether this great recession has in fact created a new class of the unemployed and the employed. Look at this. This is how bad it is. We are still right now, if you look all the way right over to the end here, right at this 4.2 number, right, how many people are looking for work for every available job. There are still in the neighborhood of four job seekers for every job that's out there. And I think that it's really useful to consider this fact when evaluating arguments that people are unemployed because they don't try hard enough. Now, it's true that some people have become discouraged and they've given up looking for work. But considering the lack of available jobs, considering that given this three quarters of every job seeker, no matter how hard they're looking, job, 
entirely irrational for some people to give up, right? I mean, part of avoiding that constant, repeated rejection may in fact be a defense mechanism, a way that people in real trouble try to guard what's left by way of dignity, what they have left by way of self-respect. As I keep repeating, right, averages obscure a lot. So as bad as the portrait is that I've been painting, it's worse in some industries than others, right? As we can see this here, right? Look at so this is number right unemployed. Right? Is is this this what do we call that? That sort of a light purpley sort of line. Right? The, the number of unemployed in each industry and number of available jobs. Right? Trade and wholesale. Discrepancy there. Right. That is that is you know four job seekers for every available job depends on the industry you're in. And in fact, right, you're in wholesale, you're in education and health services, you're in manufacturing, you're in construction. It's actually much worse than that. Over. Worse depending on your education, especially last few years, right? So there's now looking. Right, the blue line is 2007. That red line, just look at the red line for the moment. Right, that's 2010. Right, so again, remember that official unemployment rate 8.3 percent. U6, that broader measure of unemployment over 15 percent. Now we're looking at unemployment by that official number. Right, so compare this with that 8.3 number. Right, 8.3 for people with less than a high school diploma. It's almost 15 percent. Right, I don't have these data handy for you to take a look at, but if we were to look at that broader measure by uh, education in this way, right, unemployment rates right now for people with less than a high school diploma approaching 30%. Right. Contrast, right, for advanced education with a bachelor's degree or more, relatively low, right, under 5%, and in fact, if we broke that up and looked at people with, say, a master's degree or a PhD, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 2%. Unemployment rate. Right. So again, there's going to be enormous variation when we're talking about unemployment. It's going to be variation by grade, right? What, why, what kinds of jobs that people have? Had. It's going to be variation by the kind of education that they have, right? And there are, you know, an awful lot of people who say, well, you know, the solution to this is is that people need to go out and and engage in retraining. Um, easier said than done in a lot of ways, right? I mean, you think of, you know, a 55-year-old construction worker who's still a ways away from retirement, can't afford to retire. Um, is still right ten years away from access to Medicare, so won't have health insurance. All good to suggest that right a guy who you know got high school and and went off and got a good job in construction that that for an awful lot of the 20th century was enough to pay your bills and raise a family. Where's training programs going to come from? Where's the money for those training programs going to come from? What kind of skills has he developed over time in construction that are going to be truly applicable? And isn't he just going to be competing for jobs with other people who already have experience in that field? Right? It's a complicated sort of thing to suggest, well, people ought to just get retrained. It's an easy thing to say. It turns out to be a very difficult and a very complicated thing to put in practice. Okay, so we're talking about sort of right, awful, terrible consequences of job loss. I just made reference to it in talking about Medicare. This is one of them. Life insurance comes with the loss of a job, right. and of course, right, increase the likelihood of illness and untreated illness, which can have two terrible effects on a household that's that's a fragile state. Right, it's going to raise your expenses because you're not insured anymore. So any health care you get is going to have to come out of your pocket, and it's going to your ability to work. Right, the day that you are sick, you're not going to be able to go off and work, and if that illness remains treated over time, it can result in effects on your ability to work. There are folks who refer to these kinds of cycles, these kinds of, 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 of sort of ways in which these effects feed each other. They're referred to sometimes as poverty traps. Looking at that, we can see that 50 million Americans are without insurance and often a single accident or a single illness away from poverty. It's of people who are living on right now. These are not problems confined to a minority. Most American families 
are one crisis of any kind away from poverty. And as you can see here, less than a third of all families had enough saved in 2009 to get for six months or more should a crisis occur, right? And remember that chart we looked at about long-term unemployment, right, and how many people had been employed for 40 weeks. Just medical emergency can tip a family that's just getting by into crisis in really short order, right? In fact, here's the impact of that. We're looking here, right? This is, those of you who are, were around for the last webinar, you'll remember the distinction between the official poverty rate and the new supplemental poverty measure that the census began producing this past year. Um, we're looking at the, the dark blue line, the navy blue line is the official poverty rate, um, and the purpley sort of line is the supplemental poverty rate. Let's look at the supplemental rate, um, 2010, right? Top, the shorter bar, right, is that's, that's the thing we're used to looking at, right? That's income below poverty, right, which as, as even if you weren't present for the last webinar, I suspect you know is set really rather low, right? $17,000, give or take, for a family of three. Um, look at those other two bars, right? This is adding in families that are often referred to by Census Bureau and others as low income. Right. These are families whose income is not at the poverty line, but can go up to twice the poverty line. So it would be, say, $34,000 for a family of three. If we include that measure below twice the poverty line, really half of all Americans right now are poor or low income. So a sort of large chunk of information. So we're going to pause again for a moment and give you all a chance to weigh in. Um, if we can get the whiteboard called up, great, terrific, thank you. Um, so we, what we want to do here is to ask um, you all to think about um, what you've just heard, what it is that your own experience has been, and to think about what is the, if you identify the principal force that you thought was causing or aggravating the poverty that you're seeing in your neighborhood, in your sites, in your area, um, either point to them here if you see it on the left-hand side, or if there's something else that you think is most important right on the right-hand side. Um, Eric, um, if you would, would, would you just sort of remind folks of, of what they need to do? I see that folks are already jumping in, but for those who, who um, need some assistance, Sure, quick. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, you should see a toolbar somewhere up around here. Um, if you would like to point to one of those three causes that Stephen identified, click that pointer tool and then point to one of those three items on the left. Um, as Stephen was saying, if you think there's another factor that contrib has contributed or is a driver, you can click the button next to the pointer tool, which looks like the letter T. That's the text tool. And if you click on that, you can then click on the right-hand side of the screen, type in another factor, and then as soon as you click somewhere else, we'll be able to see your comment on, on the screen. Thank you. Go first. Just a little bit to, to, to both reflect it and, and to in if they haven't yet. Start typing something and you're not seeing your comment on the screen, just click somewhere else momentarily and then your comment will be posted. Terrific. We see, right, we sort of see some convergence here. Um, it's, I would say that that, that uh, looks like at least a plurality of folks are identifying unemployment as, as the principal problem that they're seeing where they are. Um, I'm going to assume that sort of a lot of folks are, are latching on to whoever it is who identified high cost of living there um, since they put it in there but haven't written anything specifically. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that we've seen, and this, this varies a lot depending on where you are, but we've certainly seen um, overall inflation, right, not necessarily the price of all sorts of goods and services going up across the country, um, but we have seen some real spikes in, in the cost of food. Um, and, you know, those are the, 
the, the sorts of effects that, of course, for obvious reasons, have the, the, the most significant income on, uh, impact on very low-income families. Um, you know, so you've got you know high cost of living. You know I'm I'm sitting here in New York City. Uh, becomes a real problem for for folks who who live in New York and particularly you know, in Boston and San Francisco, um, places with exceptionally high housing costs. Um, the consequences of, of losing a job and falling behind can be that much more difficult. And one of the you know talking about sort of traps, one of the problems if you're living in a high income area you know, where you've got uh, a high mortgage payment, right? Because remember you you bought a house at the peak of the market and the housing market collapsed and you can't move. Um, the problem is if you find yourself unemployed, you're looking for work, and you're looking for work. You you may have a job offer that a significant pay cut from what your previous job was and you've got a mortgage on a house, you're in a real dilemma, right? You've got a real problem there. So on the one hand, well, something better than nothing, oh, sure, but if this, this new job with that lower income isn't enough to pay your mortgage, you run the risk of homelessness. And if you accept that new job, it means you can't be out looking for a job that does pay enough. I mean, it's an awful set of decisions that an awful lot of um, people are, are facing. Um, in terms of what to make of this, maybe it's, it's lack of health insurance. It may just be that there are other factors that, that other people are seeing as, as much more important, right? And sort of lack of health insurance often comes after the uh, loss of a job. Um, so it's sort of a secondary effect um, that a lot of people are seeing. Um, right, a good bunch with housing, but, but poor investment in education. Right, I mean, sort of, of you know, it's... it's um, Else equal unemployed people with PhDs and advanced skills have a much easier time in today's job market than other folks do, right? So it's the location we have, and we see this popping up in all sorts of, of places when we look at the data. Um, immigration status, or I, it's cut off a bit, but it looks like it says English, right? That can be a real barrier too, right? If you're very, um, skills are not terrific, that's all obviously going to limit the kinds of jobs that are available to you. And depending on where you live and which kinds of jobs um, there are, right, you're going to, going to you know, be in a particular kind of bind depending on where you are and what it is that you're confronting. We get a little bit of the variety there. And in some ways, we can see a little bit of the lack of variety there, and the, the, the ways that, that people wind up being poor. I want to now turn to what's been done to deal with, with what it is that we've just seen, right? To ask the question, how has government responded? Well, here's one way, right? We see that red numbers of Americans are both eligible for and receiving SNAP benefits, right? Remember SNAP we used to call food stamps. And in fact, some states it is still called food stamps, right? The number is now over 46 million Americans Americans are receiving food stamps. Half of those, by the way, are children. In 40% of those food stamp benefits are now going to households where the adults are employed. Right? Well, again, sort of think to the question about underemployment. That's clearly part of what, what must be going on there, right? Other people aren't earning enough money to be able to afford food. They're still poor, or they're not working enough hours, right, which still winds up being not earning enough money, right? Uh, and keep in mind that, that those 46 million, the average food stamp benefit is about $130 per person per month. Um, a huge difference, right, if you're a family living on the edge, poor or low income, um, but fairly limited. Here's a look at what the consequences have been. Here's unemployment insurance benefits. Record sums are being spent. Unemployment. To those kinds of programs that have been in place for for many years, right? Uh, food stamps have been around 1960s, but actually sort of came out of the 1930s as a trial program. Unemployment insurance is a program that came out of the Social Security Act in 1935. Thanks to those programs that have been around for many decades now, along with uh, visions of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, the, the so-called stimulus bill, which uh, provided new benefits and did a lot by way of extended, extending or expanding benefits that were already in place. 
As a result of those activities, many millions of Americans have been kept out of poverty. And just from the programs that we look at here for the year 2009, 14 million Americans were out of poverty. So that's, I mean, I think useful for us to, to, to keep in mind that as bad as poverty is and continues to be, as bad as unemploymentism continues to be, it could be significantly worse were it not for those programs that are designed to intervene, especially in those moments of economic crisis. Right. Now, if we look at the next, right, so it's, it's, it's the effect is so broad that according to the data that we're looking at here, a lot of this is, again, coming from calculations using that supplemental poverty measure, um, poverty would be about 10 percentage points higher than its level without government cash benefits. And think back to that supplemental poverty measure. Overall measure is about 16%. Figure 26% is about where poverty would be without the programs that, that the effects of the programs that we're looking at here. Right. So these have real powerful effects for many, many, many millions of people. Right? However ineffective they might ultimately wind up being, especially in periods of, of great crisis. Okay. List almost exclusively so far on the Great Recession. We've looked a little bit at the causes, at the impact, and at the response. What does this have to do with poverty in normal times? The answer to my mind, updating only a little bit, is everything, and especially the rate of unemployment. Even in low-income households, this is, I think, something that people don't quite recognize in my experience. Even in low-income households, the majority of household income comes from wages from work. And we're looking at data here from the Congressional Budget Office in 2005. Right? We see the two households, we're looking right, right just at, um, looking at just low-income households here. Right. Only low-income households here in these data. Right now, total household income, as you can see, right, is look over here at two five. Right, it's only yeah, give or take maybe sixteen thousand dollars. Right, and remember, right, poverty is about seventeen thousand for a family of three, and two thousand five, it was about sixteen thousand for a family of three. Right, but here's the key lesson. Right, look at this. Most of that income is earnings from work. Those are low, and they're supplemented with a range of social insurance and assistance programs, right? That's what we're looking at here. But even in poor households, most income comes from work for most families. Very periods and not with opportunities to change, pause change. We can clearly hear unemployment goes up, poverty goes up. Unemployment goes down, poverty goes down. Of the Great Recession is much broader and deeper than normal. So poverty are deeper and reach more people. But there is little difference between why people are poor now they were poor before the recession. It is not the only piece of this puzzle by any means. It is an important piece in most instances. Vulnerability of wage and lower wage, less educated workers is a constant. Yes given the difficulty of finding safe, affordable child care. And each of these disadvantages that we've been talking about accumulates. Low child care can mean missing work, which can mean losing a job, which can mean loss of health care, which can increase illness, which can make it harder to get and keep a job, which can make it harder to get affordable medical care. And illness can lead to permanent disability. 
mentality to work, of unemployment and of poor physical health can impact mental health. That kind of stress on children, and you might be saying this, can have lasting physiological and emotional effects, reducing their school performance and increasing their own risks for age in your employment. Can create poverty. And Sisyphus here pushes stone up a hill only to have it roll back down again and having to push it back up all over again. It can feel like putting a huge rock up a hill and roll back down and start the process all over again. I think it's helpless. Now, we are right how important those social assistance programs are in reducing poverty. Cut the rate in half, right? But well, okay, so it's still 16%, right? Now, part of other nations have lower rates is, is simply that they do more in this regard, right? Is the absence of available jobs with benefits and wages high enough to live on, even without that, there are things that can be done to reduce poverty. Right? What we're looking at here are what are often called pre-transfer poverty rates and post-transfer poverty rates. Right? So this, these longer lines, right? that sort of deep purpley sort of line, right? is what's often called a pre-transfer poverty rate. And this is looking at how many people in a nation are poor before we factor in the effects of government programs designed to reduce poverty. So it would be health insurance and unemployment benefits and child care assistance, and food stamps, and cash assistance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As you hear, right, there are plenty of countries, in fact, have higher poverty before you factor in the government programs, right, than the United States does, right? Lots of countries, in fact, begin with much higher poverty rates than we do. If we look at this other graph, this, this sort of, what do we call that? color and pale blues and it's funny all the purples and blues are different colors. Um, if we look at this bar, right, we, after we count the effect of government programs designed to use poverty on the poverty rate, we put the high poverty rate. This group of names. And if you look, sort of the usual comparison group are, are a group called the, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Develop. It's an international um, association of, I think, 23 separate nations now. Um, and we pretty consistently have, as I think we, we saw in the last webinar, highest rates of poverty, of, of elderly poverty, etc. Right. So part of the answer to why we have more poverty now and why we've had more poverty in the past is, in some ways, not all that complicated. We do to reduce it. And after this, this, this gets to something that, that, that a couple of folks asked about, um, in the, the, the questions uh, before coming in, is one of the things that happened is that a lot of the programs that we do have in place have become less effective over time. And part of how that's happened is that benefits have simply stagnated or declined. They haven't, they haven't risen with inflation. They haven't kept pace with what's going on. So what you're looking at here, um, and this is as, as of 2007, right, so right on the edge of the Great Recession, right, the year in which the benefits right, of these programs controlling for inflation have their highest value. You can see programs was, in fact, in the past more effective at reducing poverty, and they reached more people than they are today, and in some instances here, significantly more effective. Part of the work that your programs are doing is filling in this gap here, right? Not just in periods of deep and broad crisis, but all the time, right? Because, and you know this, even in so-called normal times, there are many millions of Americans living in poverty, a number that, as we've seen, has been on the upswing for decades, not since 2007. Your term solutions are complicated, Complicated and as policy matters complicated, 
But the kind of work that many vistas do is a part of improving people's well-being in the short term. And enormously important, and not just in a superficial way. And it's important in period recession, to be sure. But unfortunately, it's all a recession. Now, why this work matters. Part of what you can do is to intervene up those back loops that I've been talking about for the hour or so. Right? And in fact, by intervening at the right moment, you can in fact short term ameliorative sometimes called strategies, you can stop a short term poverty crisis from coming a long-term poverty trap. Term aid is often long-term prevention that can interfere with that feedback loop that people can get trapped in. So we're coming on the end of our hour here, and it's, it's time to, to let all of you weigh in a bit and, and, and for us to look through the chat here and see if we've got questions. Um, and Nikki's going to pull out some more um, questions you had from from previously, um, and, um, and we'll be back with you shortly. I'll try to answer as many of your questions as as possible. But if you think about what those questions are, I'll either ask them in chat, um, or I guess that's the only place we've got right now is right to ask them in chat. Um, if you do that, think a little bit, post some questions in chat, talk amongst yourselves if you'd like. Eric's going to say a few words about how it is that we're going to be uh, proceed from here. So, Eric, please jump in. Sure. Well, it's just about noon Pacific time or 3 p.m. Eastern time, and we want to honor and respect the time for those folks that need to, that only have an hour with us and need to get going. Um, so let me just walk through some summarizing and closing slides, and as Stephen says, we'll come back and we'll take some of your questions. So um, I just want to mention that. Uh, the conversation we're having here today doesn't have to end at the end of our time with Stephen. Um, it can continue, and the way it can one way it can continue is through the Vista forums on the Vista campus. We've created a new thread uh, just this morning or afternoon um, where you can go and continue to post questions, share your own experiences, share some of your ideas and your pondering both as a result of this webinar and from your VISTA experience so far. So look in the VISTA Cafe for the new thread. And I also want to mention that we have, especially for those folks that weren't able to join us for the first in the, of the webinars in our series, we have them posted and archived and available for viewing on the VISTA campus. Um, we will be posting some resources after this webinar. And they'll be added here as well, along with the recording of this session. So you have coworkers or colleagues or vistas that weren't able to come today. Um, you can let them know. We'll have the session posted probably in about a week or so. It takes us a little bit of time to get the files re and transcribed. So with that, uh, we're in our official presentation. I want to say thank you again for joining us. And we have a couple of surveys that should pop up when the, our session is over and you close out of WebEx. The first is a short WebEx survey. Uh, then we also have one that we'd like you to take that we'll be looking at to identify ways that we can improve this webinar if we offer it again, as well as improve other webinars we may design and deliver. So with that, I'll say goodbye officially and turn off the recording in a moment. Attention for those who have a bit more time, Stephen will stay on the line a little bit more to answer questions that we'll take via chat. Uh, we need to sign up now. We thank you for joining us and participating in the conversation today. We wish you the best of luck in your VISTA service, and we thank you for the hard work you're doing in your communities to empower people living in poverty. Um, and, 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 and good day to everybody who's, who's got a sign.